our own particular band song was so terrible, I cannot tell. It's hokey, it's, it's sentimental, it's, but the ones who were two years ahead of me had a great one, and I hum it in the shower. I love this song. It comes up, and it goes like this, and it's really, I think, the theme of my life. It's, I'll still sing it. Because it goes kind of like this. I mean, I get it perfectly right, but you'll never know the difference. And it's, um, With loving song for Christ our Lord, Our voices blend in one accord. Tis the voice, it is the song Of love and labor, labor all day long. Like Therese, his little bard to sing the mercies of the Lord. The eyes of the world are on Oklahoma. Sister Helen Prejean has been visiting death row inmates for over three decades. Uh, what I have learned over my 25, 30 years crisscrossing the country and speaking about ex executions with the American people, one, is that the death penalty that we say, or people say that we believe in, is not the death penalty we have. On this morning, she was traveling to the small town of McAllister, home to Oklahoma's death house, where Richard Glossop sits on death row. The horror of executions is terrible, it's horrible, it's horrible to see person you're close to, like Sister Helen, walk out of the death chamber, walk down the, get in the car, walk down the road. Vomit of guts out. That's horrible to see. But that horror is nothing like the horror that you see when you see the lives of the people that have committed these crimes. To believe in the death penalty, you have to accept two propositions. You have to believe that some people, by virtue of the nature of the homicide they've committed, and by virtue of who they are, their character, their person, their being, are not fit to continue living. And you have to believe that the law can be sufficiently fair to reliably separate that little group of murderers from the group of murderers, the vaster, much bigger group of murderers. In 2014, Oklahoma's Corrections Department botched the execution of Clayton Lockett by not properly administering the lethal cocktail directly into his bloodstream. Months later, in January of 2015, Oklahoma did it again during the execution of Charles Warner. This time, they used the wrong drug. In the wake of the first mishandled execution, death row inmate Richard Glossop reached out to Sister Helen Prejean. Richard Glossop parachuted into my life, first through a letter, and I get a number of letters, but there was something about this letter. His handwriting is very small, and it's very, it's, his language is very understated, and dear Sister Helen, if you can help me, I'm innocent. And so something moved me in his letter, and I wrote back to him, and I said, Richard, I've begun to pray for you. I don't know if I, I think I sent him a picture or something. And I said, um, I believe you are innocent. Now, when I first started writing people on death row, if they said they were innocent, I just didn't know. Now I tend to believe them because I've been with so many people who, in fact, have been innocent. I knew that it would never be just to accompany him and comfort him as he goes to die that because the death penalty is wrong, it needs to be resisted all the way and fight might and main that this man should not die. On this occasion, Sister Helen arrived at the prison expecting to accompany Richard Glossop on his final journey. Fully prepared for the worst outcome, 
Sister Helen maintained hope for a last-minute stay. An Oklahoma appeals court granted death row prisoner Richard Glossop a last-minute stay of execution on Wednesday, only hours before he was slated to die. The decision was a response to an emergency request filed by his lawyers Tuesday afternoon. The decision came down at 11.30 a.m., only three and a half hours before his scheduled execution by lethal injection. Yes! Richard's gonna live! And oh, God, it's so happy and everybody's talking at one time. He's so happy. It's just, it's beyond words. Uh, I thank you for everything. No, and, uh, you know what, Richard? You gotta stop being I so I wrote horrible. that in your book. Thank you for letting the privilege of letting me accompany you and be in your life. You've given me life all along the way here. The best stuff in life is mutual. Definitely, I agree. We, we give agree. to each other. These are the, just some of the letters that I've received from the nuns all across this country and even in other, or all across the United States and even in other countries. And these letters have meant more to me than most of the mail that I've received in the whole time I've been down here because they give me the encouragement I need to keep fighting every day our congregation, our sisters then, uh, we were called then the Sisters of St. Joseph of Maidai. We were going to hear a talk, and it was at Terre Haute, St. Mary of the Woods, Terre Haute, Indiana. And this sister was going to come talk to us, and her name is Sister Marie Augusta Neal. And all I knew was that she was really great. She had taught uh, sociology and the New Testament, the Gospel of Jesus at Emmanuel College for a long time. And she was going to talk to us about the gospel and social justice. Well, I wasn't too happy about that because we had had sisters standing up in the meeting saying we needed to be involved in social justice, that it wasn't enough to just be with people spiritually. It wasn't enough to just have these retreats and help them to understand Jesus. What about civil rights? What about the poverty in our city? What about working for justice? And I always kind of just thought, well, you know, we're nuns. We're not social workers. How in the world are we going to tackle all these social problems? That's not what we should be about. We should be about helping Jesus, people learn the Gospels, pray, spiritual, you know, spiritual, not like a social worker. And I was resistant to all this social justice talk. I gave many an impassioned speech before the congregation, our congregation saying, look, we are nuns, all this kind of stuff. So I go to the talks reluctantly, and the second day of the talk, she got me. It, then she had announced the day before she was going to talk about Jesus, and I thought I was home free, really. I mean, I knew about Jesus. I made retreats, studied scripture at Notre Dame University. Okay, bring Jesus on. And I can tell you the line where she got me or the gospel got me, however you want to say it. And she said, Jesus preached good news to the poor. And I thought I knew what was coming next. For, I mean, yeah, good news to the poor, how God loves you, how God is like a daddy, an Abba, like how close we are to God. How we, all we have to do is go inside our hearts. We can talk to God. God's merciful. God loves us. And she said, integral to the good news Jesus preached to poor people was that they would be poor no longer. And I sat upright in my seat. I didn't move. And it was like kaboom. New Orleans St. Thomas housing projects were finished in 1941. Under Louisiana's segregated housing laws, the St. Thomas projects were occupied exclusively by whites. By the 1960s, the residual effects of the South separatist Jim Crow laws had taken a toll on poor black families. Segregation had ushered in an era of ghettoization. When Sister Helen moved into St. Thomas in 1981, she was one of only a handful of white people in the projects. So in my own life, and the realization's getting clearer and clearer to me, 
when I go is especially to speak to people who are African American, to just talk about my white privilege. And growing up as a young white woman with a successful daddy, where black people couldn't even sit in the same pews with us in church and not questioning it. And the realization was, it wasn't that I was a bad person. It's, that's what culture does, it blinds you. Honey, this is the way we do things, it's better for the races to be separate. So that waking up to the gospel call to be over on the side of the poor meant I geographically, physically, had to change where I lived and who I was hanging out with and the moving in in St. Thomas, and that's huge. You got to walk that on somebody. Well, you got to walk it for yourself. Ain't nobody here can walk for you. You got to walk the bed valley for yourself. St. Thomas Housing Development, like most public housing, in this country was riddled with, with poverty and violence and teen pregnancy and all of the things, all the stereotypes that everybody had. But at the same time, it had amazing people and amazing families who were doing amazing things um, when she moved here. Um, so it's, it, it was, I don't know how you describe, it was public housing and public housing was what public housing, at that time, public housing housed basically around this country, not just here in New Orleans, it housed uh, basically African Americans here um, in New Orleans because uh, white flight had taken place. And so there were uh, hardly any white people in public housing. So we had all the dynamics that were going on in the 80s. Uh, I saw the divestment of the federal government uh, in public housing at that time. We were fighting for basic, affordable, decent, and sanitary housing in the 80s in the United States for people. And uh, amazingly enough, we're still fighting for affordable, decent, sanitary housing for poor people in this country and in this city. Um, so like my daddy used to say, some things change, but most things remain the same. Just change the way they look. People live from, I don't even know if they live from day to day a lot of times, from hour to hour. You know, um, you never quite knew how things were going to work out. If you were employed, then you never were sure whether you'd have the job the next day. Um, money was always an issue. Life was, um, you know, for a lot of people, life was, was scary because there was a lot of gun violence. There was a lot of... Um, domestic violence, there were, all of those elements were there. I was going to church in the morning, it was a Saturday morning, and I met this guy on the street, and he was looking, he asked me for money, and I said, I have no money. There was something about him that wasn't real good, and I felt a little bit worried. So I came back to the apartment, I went upstairs, and I gave him, uh, I gave him I brought down five dollars and I gave it to him. And then he followed me down the street and he said, just give me your watch and your ring. And I said, I'll give you my watch. I said, but please not my ring. And then he said, give me your ring. So I gave it to him. And as I walked away, uh, he said to me, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry. And I was very sad too. But, uh, you know, I thought it'd be a terrible thing to, to lose this ring that was kind of a symbol of my life in some way. And then afterwards I thought, I don't need to get another ring. My life is the symbol. And if I don't live that life, then Symbols are no good. I know for a fact that people like Sister Lillian and Helen Prejean, man, and I, shoot, Sister Lori, that is straight up God's work. You know, I, straight up. Folk will redefine, no, that ain't God. No, 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 you know. You may not agree with it, 
but you know. And you know, you know how I know? Because it's like, it's about life and life giving and, 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 and opposed to life taking. It's about feeding people who are hungry. It, it, it's about clothing people who are naked. Let me tell you, I, when I was a young organizer one time, I didn't, and still don't understand all of this, but I got called a communist by some guy. He said, you're a communist. And I go like, I'm Baptist. You know what I'm saying? So I understood they told me, you, you feed the hungry, you, know, you, you house the homeless. That come out of my Sunday school partner. That come out of God. I'm not a kind of. So it's like for me, the way that I was taught in terms of what we supposed to be doing for each other, they showing up doing God's work. And I learned that in Sunday school. Well, a so social justice, if it's real, is not just about helping people get to the doctor or help them get a load of groceries or help them make sure they don't get their electricity turned off or to turn it back on. Social justice is, well, one of the definitions of this Presbyterian minister I heard once was, you know, justice is about figuring out what belongs to whom and then giving it back. Uh, so social justice ultimately is about reordering society. When we create a, a safe place for ourselves, that we in fact lose a lot in life. You know, we set up those parameters and say, these are my friends, this is my area of work, but then a whole world opens up to you here. And, and, and that's a very wonderful thing, you know. So I, 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 I've, been, I've been very blessed uh, uh, to, to live here and to be part of life here. You know, it was a funny thing. Uh, somebody came by here recently and they were talking about Helen. They'd met Helen. Helen was in this house and they were kind of in awe of her, like, you know, and just, just give me the three sentences. Somebody asked a question. Just give me three sentences that would describe Helen for you. I said, she's a space cadet. She's very funny and she's very intense. And like, it was like they were expecting this saint. And Helen is this like totally human person. One day in 1982, a volunteer in the projects asked Sister Helen if she would correspond with an inmate on death row. That inmate was Patrick Saunier. He and his younger brother, Eddie, had been tried and convicted for the brutal murder of young high school sweethearts, David LeBlanc and Loretta Ann Bork. Eddie Saunier was given a life sentence while Pat was on death row in the Louisiana State Prison at Angola. The death penalty had recently been reintroduced after having been abolished by the United States Supreme Court in 1972. No one had been executed in Louisiana for years. When Sister Helen began writing Patrick Saunier, she had no expectation that she would one day accompany him to his execution. This is Angola Prison. This is where the first death row was when I went to visit Pat Saunier. So I wrote him in January of 82. So I'm gonna guess it was about February. I came for my interview with the chaplains here, the priest, uh, who were the chaplains to be approved. And, and so then I was approved and came for my first visit. I was scared out of my mind. In the visitor center over there that you had to go with the wand and the pat search. Uh, you know, big scary sign, you know, you subject to body searches, body cavities, dog sniffing. I didn't even read the whole sign. I just found it terribly intimidating. And then the guards has to court you in through one bullpen after another with the gates clanging. And, and I, the, the uh, death row was also CCR, contained cell restricted. So they had inmates from that, and so they said, woman on the tear, and all of them had to drop away out of the halls, everything. And then we rounded this corner, and then there was this green metal door with a little bitty window with bars in it, and above it these red block letters, death row. And then they <clears throat> brought me in through that and locked me in a room, had a big old fan going. It was real noisy and they had like six booths 
heavy mesh screen in front, as big as telephone booths, where inmates would be brought. And I was the only one that day. Another time I went with it, and you're both yelling, so because it's so hard to hear, and you have to yell over the fan. And they said, we'll get your man. And for the first time, I really began to be nervous about him, because I thought, We've only been writing these letters. He seems really nice in the letters, but I don't know what, I've never talked to a murderer for two hours. I mean, I don't even know what he did. What's he really gonna be like? Turned out, I found out he was thinking the same thing. I'm gonna be talking to a nun for two hours. I hope we don't have to do all that scripture and God talk all the time, as I later found out. And the guards brought him in and I looked up at him at, through this mesh, heavy mesh, and he was smiling. And uh, I went, oh my God, he's a human being. I saw his humanness, I could see it. In it was heart and mind for her, and it wasn't curiosity. And somehow she had enough internal fortitude, uh, we now call it resilience in the trauma circles, that she could withstand the shit that you see when you are this close to the death machine, when you come to love people on death row, come to love their families, and see them executed on a date certain, and, and see all of the vulgar, coarse ugliness that goes on around it. It is so unpleasant. It is so unseemly. It is so gut-wrenching, you know, knee-knocking, uh, destructive that you want away from it, you want to run from it, you want to be far away from it. Uh, and here was this, you know, she's very tiny, she's a petite nun. Here is this little woman, a nun, who is willing to go all in, all in. So, uh, God's in some interesting places, Helen. <laughs> Talk to me about the that. The God of life is, uh, tries to get everywhere, I think. And uh, there's no name more invoked for what goes on here in executions, the death penalty, the harshness of punishment, than the, quote, Christian message, that when you sin, you do penance for your sin. And pain and punishment has been interpreted from the beginning. Even like Justice Scalia says, Christians know we should be punished for our sins. So that pain, punishment, it's just the groundwork of this prison in many ways. Even death, because uh, they sacrificed, they, they, give, they took a life, they sacrificed their life, and they are thereby redeemed. And in, in that death house, you will see religious paintings. So you see Elijah going up on a fiery chariot. You see Daniel in the lion's den, and you have to go through this earthly suffering now, but that's the way you win your eternal reward. And anybody who participates in the process, it's the way they justify what they do too. So it's a big, big part of holding up the death penalty. A little pet name for it, Gruesome Gertie, you name it, yeah. I mean, it's an awful, unspeakable thing. I couldn't believe how quickly they worked when Pat went, sat in it. And he was looking for me, see, because I told him, look at me. And so I was watching too, and they were working real fast, because they practiced over and over again for this. And so before they strapped his right hand down his trunk, legs, so he reached his hand out like that, and I could see him. And, uh, 
And then they put this leather mask over his face to protect the witnesses from seeing what happens to a human face when 1900 volts are in your body. And so on that instrument, a torch of people have been killed, and he was one of them. On April 5, 1984, Louisiana executed Patrick Saunier by electrocution. His death certificate read, cause of death, legal homicide. After witnessing Saunier's death and several subsequent executions, Sister Helen realized that the secret ritual performed at midnight out of the public eye would only be ended if the American people could be brought close to it. In 1993, she authored Dead Man Walking, an account of her experiences accompanying Patrick Saunier and Robert Lee Willie to their deaths. The book spent 31 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Dead Man Walking was a gift of love from Sister Helen Pujan to society, a real gift of love. It was, a, it was a dedication and a bleeding of her heart and a, and a Band-Aid that tried to cure what she couldn't cure, what the lawyers couldn't cure, what the people helping couldn't cure. Embedded in her message uh, is the underwritten script. Look at little sister Helen, a nun in New Orleans, and look what she did. And what's holding you back? I have a really good friend, Jason Epstein, who is uh, Helen's great uh, friend and who published the book when he was at Random House. And he signed the book up and had been telling me sort of vaguely about this nun in New Orleans. Oh, you need to meet my friend Helen, because I was living about half the time in those days in New Orleans and the other half in New, York, in New York. And he kept bugging me, and the book was getting closer and closer to coming out. And so, of course, he wanted me to write about Helen and promote the book. But mainly, he really did honestly believe that, that we would be friends. And I said, Jason, oh God, every red flag I had came up. Okay, bleeding heart nun? <laughs> nah, not interested. Um, worked in a housing project, really not interested. Anti-death penalty, I was just determined that I was still pro-death penalty in those days, even after Ricky Ray. And uh, uh, I just said, I, you know, I have no intention of meeting this woman. No way. And so, um, but Jason is really the smartest person I know. And he, as I was leaving to go catch a plane to, to, to New Orleans from New York, this messenger came and delivered this box with this, with a blue, you know, with a, just a Xerox manuscript. I mean, it wasn't even, the book was not anywhere near in a bound galley yet. So, for some reason, I didn't have a direct flight. I was like, you know, sort of Hansel and Gretel leaving. I just was. I started reading the book on the plane. I was just leaving loose papers everywhere I went, and littering airports from New York to New Orleans, and. I read it so intensely and so quickly that by the time I landed in New Orleans. A few hours later, uh, this was, I don't think I had a cell phone in those days. This is in the early 90s, 92, I think. Um, uh, I stopped at the pay phone in, um, in the airport and called Helen and said, we got to get together. And, you know, I grew up in Memphis. And I knew one Catholic. And I didn't know her until like my senior year in high school, segregated high school. And somebody brought in this new girl, introduced her, and somehow we all knew she was a Catholic. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I had no clue what that meant, but I knew they crossed themselves. So the next day, when we said our obligatory, uh, the Lord's Prayer, right, I crossed myself. And I had a ponytail. Ms. Nelson, I guess it was the sixth grade, jerked me up by that ponytail like I was being raptured. It was like I was a Hare Krishna. I was out of that seat and in the principal's office saying Charlotte Jane tried to cross herself. And our high school and our junior high principal, Ms. Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, Bed, uh, yeah, the, great, the granddaughter of the founder of the KKK, uh, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, a Southern Confederate hero, Bertha Forrest, is sitting there looking at me saying, why would you cross yourself? And called my mother and they 
sent me home from school. So I had a notion that Catholics were pretty exotic and definitely something I wanted to know more about, right? And they were forbidden. So, you know, I, I still... It's just like racism. Those things stay with you. You either have to deal with them, fight them, or lie about them and say, oh, they weren't there. I would never be, do something bad like that. But for me, it was kind of a romantic notion of somebody who cried. And I couldn't get the crossing right, you know, I just because I didn't have anybody to show me. So I was just trying it on to see what would happen. And it was a, a lot of problems. So uh, when I heard about Sister Helen, I was talking with Steve Bright, who's a saint uh, from Atlanta. He runs a clinic at Yale, the death penalty, uh, director of the Southern Center for Human Rights, big, wonderful voice. And we were hunting for a lawyer for somebody in Louisiana or Mississippi who was set to be executed. It's about 9.30 at night. Steve calls and says, I can't find a lawyer for him. You got any ideas? And I, well, I heard about this nun down in Louisiana. You know, Helen Prejean, why don't you call her? I don't have her number, but we could probably find it. Somebody will know a phone number for her. And Steve said, well, I was going to try her. I called down there, but God damn it, she's writing a book. And I've told Helen this story. And he's like, we need another book. <laughs> that shows how stupid we were. I was filming um, the client, and I read some reviews, and then they re read the book, and then uh, tried to find Helen. And coincidentally, at the very end of that shoot, we were in New Orleans for about a week or so, and so it was possible for us to schedule a, a dinner. And um, I just thought that, well, the death penalty was something that I felt very strongly about, but what I really found compelling about the story was the question of unconditional love and whether or not anybody can do that other than Jesus for someone that you haven't birthed. Um, and uh, I like the fact that she was not a hero, that she made mistakes and that she kind of kept getting pulled into the situation. She didn't know who Susan Sarandon was. And so she doesn't know movie stars' names and all. She's doing a little better now since we had this film. But she didn't know who she was, so she went and ran it. She didn't tell you that story? So. Yeah, she went to rent it. And um, she thought that Gina Davis was Susan Sarandon. She got them mixed up. And so, so when she went to the Bonton restaurant, and met Susan Sarandon here in New Orleans, she said, like this, I thought you were Gina Davis. I don't want to be buried here. They said they was going to call my mom and ask her about the funeral. I uh, sat down and wrote the first draft, and it came very fast. And then um, I did another draft. I sent the, uh, the, my first draft, of course, to Helen, and uh, got her notes. and. Um, it was funny because, you know, I hadn't had a relationship with a nun since eighth grade. So, uh, so to get her notes back, a, a lot of great insight into, um, uh, into uh, the death penalty and notes on that and, 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 and the scenes I'd chosen and the details that I might have missed. But then there were spelling corrections, and I was like, oh, my God, really? I just, <laughs> I'm back in eighth grade. She was about to leave. The hem of her skirt was coming out, and I, she was in such a hurry, so I pinned it forth one of those little tiny safety pins. And she was gone out the door. You don't know when you see your child leave through a door that yes. you're never going to see them alive no. again. If I'd known that, I would have told her how much I love her. You know, my last words to her, the last that she ever heard from me, were about the hem of a skirt. It fairly and honestly brought people over into the suffering of both sides, the victims' families, 
going through the suffering of losing their son and their daughter, teenage daughter and son, and on the other perpetrator who did it, but he also has a mother and he also has a family, and then takes the audience and the nun in the middle, as Susan and Tim both say, the nun didn't know what she was doing. She was in over her head, and I was. I think that the discourse about capital punishment was there. I mean, we had it, then we didn't have it, then we had it, and it's always been used politically. But I don't think anybody really knew the details of what it means. It's like people have very, um, very strong reactions if you ask them about birth control or abortion or gay rights, but they don't necessarily have any information. You know, they just have a conditioning. So the death penalty was like that. And what Dead Man Walking did was make it real. For me, it wasn't about sides. It was about what is the truth of this situation. And that's a deep truth. And, and it's not a simple thing. It's not black and white. And yes, we've, we've gotten to the place where we have understood that this is a man and a human being. And what he did was a horrible thing. And I just felt, well, this is not about trying to convince anybody. This is about presenting the truth. The Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, or Vatican II as it is informally referred to, is arguably the most significant event in modern Catholic history. Pope John XXIII convened the Council in 1962 in an effort to have the world's largest religion face the challenges of present-day society. I got the habit and ward for six months, and while I was parading, processing in and in my habit, um, in this very building, the meeting was happening where they were deciding to get rid of the habit. <laughs> so we made them into suits within six months. So um, I think the energy of that time, that period of the 60s, and that sense of possibility was taken very deeply into the soul of women, religious in particular. And we were part of every one of those movements. You know, When you see the pictures of Selma, what you see among women religious in habits are our sisters of St. Joseph who were there. So th there's, that was very important. The anti-war movement was very important to us. The, the kind of fledgling feminist movement, all of those things I think are foundational to who we've become. You know, people say it was the sisters who took Vatican II the most seriously and looked around and said, gosh, this is a great way to, to spend our lives. Um, not so much with the hierarchy. You know, there was a lot of power and privilege to be uh, protected there that we never had. And so this embracing of the role of lay people was, you know, mother's milk to us because it's always been our orientation. The Congregation of St. Joseph was formed in 2007, when seven existing congregations in the United States joined forces. Sister Helen is a member of the congregation. Now we've been growing in that as sisters for these years since Vatican II, and I've grown with them. My thing is, it's like we were a wave rising, and I rose with the wave in the sisterhood. They have always been sustenance, support, encouragement for me. And we had tough times coming through the 60s and the 70s where we were trying to sort out all the changes. How could we be free, independent, or interdependent beings and really be able to follow where the Spirit's leading us, yet to be a community and to stay like a school of fish when you got fish darting all over the place. We had to learn how to come to decisions from consensus, how to be of one mind and heart and to just appreciate there was going to be diversity. 
the shifting focus of many American nuns from a contemplative, cloistered life to a dynamic engagement with the most vulnerable groups in society did not go unchallenged. A doubting Vatican under Pope Benedict XVI launched an investigation to gauge if American nuns had strayed too far from their Catholic teachings. Historically in the church, when there is a perceived problem, the church, and it is an extraordinary thing to investigate a group, it's much more historically, uh, used much more historically as an individual person being, uh, for instance, if there's a financial impropriety, a bishop might get investigated. So this unprecedented investigation of an entire lifestyle of only U.S. women religious, on the supposition that there was, because of the numbers, as you just spoke earlier, uh, there is some problem with the quality of our life. And we could never get a definition of what was included in the quality of our life, but there were a lot of indications that it was our um, straying from a more orthodox way of living. So um, we had, um, a 20-page questionnaire that we were supposed to fill out about our congregations. We had, um, for instance, here, um, we had five people, not of our choosing, but of the Vatican's choosing, who stayed here for an entire week and investigated us. They interviewed us. They interviewed all, all sorts of people about us. And then they wrote a report about us, which we never saw. So we have no idea what was said about us. And you know, it was an interesting thing. We decided we could be really crabby with these people, but we decided to say, you know, these people are in a tough space. And if our mission is around unity. <laughs> so we did this thing where we just really tried to be sister to these people. And every night we send them a bottle of red wine and a bottle of white wine. And um, I'll tell you what, I think, I think they left here, whatever impression they had when they came, they left here at least saying there's something important happening here that is of God. It appears that um, from the outcome of it that we passed the test, I guess you could say, um, that there um, were no dramatic actions taken, there were no judgments that we were not being faithful. Um, there was an acknowledgement that the way we live our life in community and in religious life is different than in past ages, um, from, as you say, what we wore to the, the patterns of our days. Um, but that the finding was that our um, prayer life, our adherence to the gospel, our faithfulness to the church um, was unquestionable. We got clearer and clearer and deeper and deeper into our own roots by knowing it doesn't matter whether we please any authority other than the inner authority that we know we have to be responsible for. And so it's not fun to be uh, in the positions we've been, but it's certainly not the end of interplanetary life if people don't congratulate us for everything we do. In one of the killing pockets of the United States where you have a prosecutor uh, that goes for the death penalty every chance he gets, comes this man, Richard Glossop, in this cobbled together on the word solely of a 19-year-old meth addict that Richard Glossop was involved in the murder of somebody. Uh, you have him sitting on death row and close to being killed where 112 people have already been executed. And when Richard came up for execution, before him a man, Charles Warner, had been killed in Oklahoma, who's been botching executions, Clayton Lockett. Uh, before him it took 45 minutes for them to try to kill him. Charles Warner had been executed, and Charles Warner's crying out as they uh, injected the poison in his veins. I got acid in my veins. And so Richard's next 
Oklahoma had killed Charles Warner with the wrong drug, with potassium acetate, which used to be used in embalming people. It changes the liquid composition of the blood. And they had lied about it when they gave the report that he had been killed with potassium chloride, which is usually the drug that they give people to stop the heart. And, but then, with the investigation that started happening around it, they found out that the syringes they had used for his execution had potassium chloride on it, but the vials showed it was potassium acetate. And then, you know, there was investigative journalism, there was freedom of information, there was an autopsy done. He was killed with potassium acetate, but nobody was there for Charles Warner. No one heard his cry, no one knew the case of this man. So Oklahoma could kill him and get away with it. What's really interesting to see is the great disparity of practice that we have in the United States with the death penalty for over 30 years now. The states that practice slavery do roughly, now it's like 74%, 75% of all executions. These are the very states that had slaves, had the most lynchings. The Death Belt and the Bible Belt are the same, very same states. Religion is used the most to uphold it, it as it was used to uphold slavery. Lynching was a common practice in post-Reconstruction America, a tool of terror used against African Americans. Caddo Parish, tucked into the northwest corner of Louisiana, was one of the lynching capitals of the South. As American society lost its taste for lynchings and the public killings waned, the number of death sentences handed out to black Americans increased. Nowhere did the rate of death penalty convictions grow more rapidly than in Caddo Parish. Under District Attorney Dale Cox, from 2010 to 2014, more people were sentenced to death per capita in Caddo than in any other county in the United States. Rodriguez Crawford was tried and sentenced to death in Caddo Parish in 2013 for the killing of his one-year-old son. The jury's guilty verdict hinged on a flawed pathology report and the righteous zeal of District Attorney Cox. This, this ain't real. It just ain't real. It got to a point I ain't wanna live no more. And I tried to hurt myself, you know. But thank, thank for the high power that I had some people, you know, working in the jail that had me, let my mom come see me a little more time than what she forced to. They got my mind back right. And the next day I had another visit and it was my daughter. So that really got me a little back focused. But at first I didn't want to be here no more. And I tried to take my life. The three weeks in, in jail. When they said I couldn't go to the funeral. After obtaining a death sentence for Rodriguez, D.A. Cox wrote to Louisiana's probation department, urging them that he receive, quote, as much physical suffering as it is humanly possible to endure before he died, close quote. Rodriguez Crawford was sent to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. He was 23 years old. Half the people on his tier on death row were from Cato Parish. So you have Dale Cox saying, when he writes, you know, to the, his suggestion to the Department of Corrections, make this man suffer as much as is physically possible. Jesus commanded the death penalty. And he quotes Jesus in that way. At a hearing uh, before the Judicial Committee, the Louisiana Legislature, when we wanted to introduce a bill to abolish the death penalty, the prosecutor got up to the committee and said, Jesus is for the death penalty. And Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So you can take these little quotes from scripture without an understanding of the thrust of the spirit of them, and you can quote them to your own purpose. There's a saying, the devil can quote scripture to his own purposes. And you see that being used 
with the death penalty. You're trying to get the ultimate authorization. And now the man convicted and then acquitted in the 2012 death of his one-year-old son will not face retrial. That's the dramatic announcement today from the Caddo Parish DA's office. One-year-old Rodarius Lott was very sick before he died. He had pneumonia and a blood infection, so that raised the question, was this really a homicide? Well, without any evidence of intentional acts by the father, Rodericus Crawford, that directly caused the death, the state was forced to look into other... I used to hate Dale Cox. That's what I don't hate him. I said, I wish you get some help. I don't hate him. I don't wish nothing bad on him. I did. But that man, he could have did a lot. But guess what? He wanted that conviction. So, but that conviction leave a lot of pain. The Caddo Parish District Attorney's Office formally dismissed all charges against Mr. Crawford. No apology or explanation was given. I actually was arrested in 1982. I actually went to trial in January of 1985. At the time, Orleans Public Defender's Office was not really funded. It was, you know, they, they had very little resource. Um, they had very little, few lawyers to handle capital cases. As a matter of fact, my lawyer, um, they didn't come see me until the day, the night before my trial. And they actually came to see, to ask me one question. Did I have any clothes to wear because I was going to trial the next, the next day? Calvin Duncan spent nearly three decades in prison for a crime he did not commit. After almost 30 years in the Louisiana State Penitentiary, Calvin Duncan was offered an Alford plea. The deal is you can continue to tell the truth or for a second you can forget the truth and tell a lie, and you'll get out of prison. An Alford plea allows a defendant to assert his innocence, but he must admit in court that the evidence the prosecution has would be likely to persuade a judge or jury to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And here, I'm a person that believes that the court, you know, you fight hard enough, the court is going to do the right thing. That hope, you know, I lived with hope for a long time. And I convince other people to, you know, that keep hope alive and that our, you know, the criminal justice system, you know, you know, it's not perfect, but, you know, they get it right at some point. But all that went out the window. January the 7th, 2011, where I had to take my deal. I had to say, I had to tell a lie. I had told the truth all those years and, the, and I was convinced that that's, I'm going to die in prison telling the truth. And so I took the deal. When we moved out here, it was, it was just a gravel. But then they, you know, they put a little two-lane street, no sidewalks, the ditch was open uh, in the front. That's where Daddy would rake all the leaves and burn the leaves in the ditch. And, uh, well, I, I know my dad who was a lawyer, uh, he, he worked with a lot of blood, uh, black people. They would come to him and he would take their cases and they would just pay him whatever they could. And, you know, so I, I knew how they were treated, but my awareness began when Helen moved into the projects. And then I got it firsthand from her, uh, what it was like, and uh, I even went and spent the night with her and Helen's description of that. Uh, and that's, that's when my awareness was really awakened and, and I began to think, you know, what can we do about that. Black people were white people's servants. Mom and Daddy were kind to Ellen and Jesse. And we'd go sit here on the porch in the afternoon and talk to Ellen while she was doing her little things around her little house. It was just Ellen and Jesse's house. And never questioned what Jim Crow meant. 
that Ellen and Jesse could never drink from a water fountain or even in Sacred Heart Church. They had to sit in a separate place. When you're unaware, you're just unaware. And that's why I'm very conscious that the way grace happens is we wake up. And when I awaken to the deeper dimension of the gospel of Jesus that calls us to work for justice is when I moved into the St. Thomas House in Project Jackson. Me Boudreau was missing for three days. And so some of her friends were coming to Clotillo and say, Clotillo, your husband, Boudreau, he's been missing for three days. Don't you think you better go to the police? And you better report him as missing or, or something. She goes, yeah, well, maybe so. So anyway, so close to you, she goes to the police and she said, well, ma'am, would you just describe your husband for us so we know what he looks like? She said, yeah, yeah. He said he's six feet three. He's well, well built. Uh, he's handsome as a movie star. And, uh, but our friend, Miss Landry was talking to me. She said, but Clotilde, Boudreau don't look like that at all. He's fat, he ain't got any hair. He's he missing two of his teeth. She said, well, the way I figure is this, if they bring me back that one that I describe, I'm going to say, let Boudreau go. <laughs> she can handle herself. If, if you know her, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's got guts, I tell you that, because boy, when she was living in the uh, projects down in New Orleans, mama went down there one time. <laughs> mama said never again, because I mean, firearms were going off during the middle of the night, you know, and they didn't have any air conditioning, so they had to sleep with the windows open. And uh, it really scared my mama, you know, and uh, from that point on, it opened my eyes to make me realized that really she was living in a dangerous situation. At the time of, of Julie's death in the, in the Oklahoma City bombing, I just, immediately after her, her death, I didn't even want a trial for Tim McVeigh or Terry Nichols for probably a month. I wanted the bastards fried. And I finally accepted the fact after about a month we had to have trials to hopefully learn the truth. But I still carried the revenge, heavy revenge factor, and wanting the death penalty for them. On April 19, 1995, Bud Welch's 23-year-old daughter Julie and 167 others were killed in a domestic terrorist attack on a federal building in Oklahoma City. I went to the bomb site uh, at the end of January of 1996. It was a cold day. And I, my head was aching from abusing alcohol. I started drinking heavily after her death. As a smoker, that went from one pack to three or four packs of cigarettes a day. And that day I went to the bomb site, every muscle in my body ached from my alcohol poisoning. And I said to myself that, that three o'clock that afternoon that you got to do something different. What you're doing is not working. And I went to examining my conscience for a period of probably a couple of weeks and, and realizing that the day that we took Tim McVeigh or Terry Nichols from their cage to kill them simply was not part of my healing process. And Tim McVeigh was, was executed on June the 11th, 2001 in Terre Haute, Indiana, more than six years after Julie's death. And I was in Terre Haute on the prison grounds. I didn't witness his execution, <clears throat> but I was there. I got a phone call from, uh, in June from Attica Prison in Western New York, from a nun. And the purpose of her call was to ask me to come to the Buffalo area to speak against the death penalty. She knew I had been doing that. I had been in Syracuse in April, a couple of months before. That's how she got my name and phone number. And we had about a one-hour conversation, and I told her about seeing Bill McVeigh on television a couple of weeks after Julie's death. Bill was standing in front of his house, about 20 miles north of Buffalo, New York, and he was stooped over a flower bed, kind of like he was pulling weeds from it. 
television camera off to his right, and the reporter was there. Bill kept his shoulder and face turned away from the camera. I don't recall any of the questions that reporter asked him or any answers that Bill gave. But the last question, Bill stood almost straight up. He's about 6'3 or 6'4, and he looked directly into the, the television camera lens for a couple of seconds. And when he did, I saw a large man physically stooped in grief. He had a deep pain in his eye that I recognized immediately because I was living the same pain at the same time. And so when I went out to his house, and we spent about uh, half hour in his garden, Bill had asked me <clears throat> when we were out in his garden, he said, Bud, can you cry? And I thought, why is he asking this question? And I said, well, yeah, Bill, I can, and I usually can do it quite easily. He said, all my adult life I've been unable to cry. He said, my father was much the same way. He said, I've had a lot to cry about the last three and a half years, and I just can't do it. And he told me as we were walking toward the house that Jennifer, his youngest daughter, was there, that she was wanting to meet me. And we sat at the kitchen table. Jennifer sat across from me, and Bill sat to my left. It's a round table, and it's pushed up against the wall. And up on the wall above the table are family snapshots, just small photos, of his granddaughter that lived in Florida and his oldest daughter, Patty, and, and other family members. After we were talking there for about five minutes, I noticed this, the largest picture on the wall was kind of behind my right shoulder, and it was an 8 by 10 of Tim. Well, for the next hour and a half, quite frequently, I'm glancing at that picture of Tim on the wall. I'm not looking at it with anger, anything like that. I'm looking, I'm looking at his photo more in disbelief. Here's this young man, three years older than Julie, and trying to figure out in my mind, while I'm talking to his sister and his dad, how he could kill my daughter. After a long period of time, <clears throat> I glanced at the wall again, and I knew that I had looked up there many times, and each time I looked, of course, they saw me look. And I felt the need to say something. Didn't know what to say. And finally, I just said, God, what a good-looking kid. When I said that, Bill just looked up at, at the wall and pointed at the, at the photo and said, that's Timmy's high school graduation picture. <clears throat> but when he said that, there was this great big tear that rolled out of his right eye down his cheek. And I could see at that moment this father could cry for that son. Because at that moment, <clears throat> Tim was on death row in Florence, Colorado. And he knew that Tim needed him desperately, but he knew there was nothing he could do for him. I got up from the table and I shook Bill's hand. Jennifer walked around the table. And... I extended my hand to her as I had when we had met a couple hours earlier. She didn't take my hand. She grabbed me around the neck and started hugging me. That escalated to sobbing, which I had not experienced as, as an adult. And I felt trapped, <clears throat> like I didn't know what to do next. So finally I took her face off of my shoulder, and I just held her face in my hands, and I said, Look, honey, the three of us are in this for the rest of our lives. We can make the most of this if we choose. I don't want your brothers to die, and I'll do everything that I can to prevent it. Denver, Colorado gave a talk in a big ballroom. And there was a whole bunch of people, lawyers and people working on human rights, on the death penalty. And it had been a long night, and there had been a long line of people then to get the book signed. And we were coming to the end of the evening, and there were two guys at the end of the... And I could tell they were friends. They were talking to each other and kind of joking and laughing. And then it's the end of the night. I'm all a little zany, the last two. And I, I said, I've been watching you two. Who are you two? Are you two? I don't know what made me say this. Are you a used car salesman or what? I've been watching the two of you, you know. <laughs> and they had approached the table by then, and uh, 
And so one, they kind of looked at each other and smiled, and one of the men said, well, sister, I don't know how to tell you this exactly, but, and then he said, my son killed his son. And it was two fathers from a Columbine killings. One who had had a son who had killed the other man's son, and those two men found each other and helped heal each other. And we have these, this cloud of witnesses all around our country holding up for us that we don't have to be a people who imitate the worst possible human behavior. You killed, so we're going to kill you. There's a line that is in the film, and it's also in the play of Dead Man Walking, and it's also in the opera of Dead Man Walking. It's true, it happened with him. All my figures, I'd have to come to prison to find love. My whole life, I've never known love. Thank you, ma'am, for loving me. And that was shortly before he died. And to me, God's present, where there's love present, where a person's really remorseful, God's present. But the Sister Helen gives over 100 talks each year, many on college campuses. Her primary mission is to educate the public about the practice of the death penalty. If you've ever been to a death penalty trial and you hear the closing arguments of the prosecutor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do not have any compassion for him and look over at that family and they're never going to see their daughter graduate from college and they are never going to see their grandchildren. Do justice for that family. Give to him what he deserves. And sometimes you even you see victims' family coming out of a courtroom, V for victory, we won. He got the death penalty. And they start waiting. They start waiting. And their grief is public. They're in a holding pattern. You just wait now, and we're going to summon you. And when it's time, you will get to send a representative, and you will get to watch as the state of Texas will now take the life of the one who took the life of your loved one, and you get to watch it, and it is going to heal you. It is going to give you closure. They use different words. It is going to give you justice. Sister Helen Prejean, she's the non- and anti-death penalty activist made famous by her book and the film Dead Man Walking. Jurors are determining now whether or not to sentence Johar Sarnai up to death after his conviction on 30 counts. Well, let's talk about Sister Prejean. What we needed Helen for is that uh, Johar's legal defense team were skilled lawyers skilled investigators, skilled paralegals, skilled mitigation people. And uh, in Jahar's case, he was such a spiritual kid. He believed so deeply in God. And Islam is such a sophisticated, complicated religion with such ancient traditions. Uh, I couldn't bring that out in him. I could, I could hear him talk about it and I knew there was a hunger, a, a real visceral hunger and need that he had. And there was no way in hell the court was going to let us bring an imam in unless it was a CIA informant. You know, no way could I bring in an Islamic scholar. But the only person who, of the cloth, whom I trust, in the world is Helen Prejean. Jahar had never met a nun before. So for him, this is an eye-opening, revolutionary jump. You know, his, the evolution of his mind just went forward an eon. He was in a whole different world. And imagine if the nun you meet is Helen Prejean. You know, so the intensity was amazing. And what scared me to death about it, I thought, oh, fuck. She, <laughs> Helen, I can say what she says. I just can't say what he says. Helen sits down, we're talking, and Jahar is hardcore Salafi, kind of. Yeah, as much as a kid can be anything. But he knows what he's supposed to believe. 
right? And he knows what he's done, and he's not about to betray that. Doesn't want to betray it. And I'd say within 15 or 20 minutes, Helen is telling him some of the corniest jokes in the world. I thought, this is just not going to go. This, you know, I thought, fuck me, is what I thought. I Charlotte. You know, we were so close, that close. I thought they, I thought that she had it. But now these jokes. Oh, they, Teal Boudreaux? Oh, yeah, Boudreaux jokes. She's telling Boudreaux jokes. And this is a Chechen kid. You know, what the Boudreaux doesn't translate. Well, it did. He didn't just take a liking to her. He responded in kind. He had jokes. So they went through this joke-telling thing. And his were as corny as hers. So they bonded. Of course, I'm in Boston testifying, but Sister Margaret and Carolyn clearly are back on the home front with the phone, the internet, and I mean it started streaming in. Carolyn said, I never heard so much cussing and using bad language on the phone in my entire life. So this man said, you work with that nun? You working with that nun? And he started using all these terrible words. And she said, well, sir, I'll be glad to relate to her. What would you like to relate to her? And she said, he just started. They would call me every name in the book. They call me the C word. They use every, I mean, obscenity. Uh, and one of the people that would call and told Sister Margaret, you know, Margaret is a very kind, meek person. She always speaks in a soft voice. She's very respectful to everybody. And boy, here comes this stream. And said, she said, I'm sorry, Sister Helen isn't here. I'm in the office. I'm answering the phone. What are you doing answering the phone for that nun? She, you know where you ought to be? You ought to get yourself to some karma-like comet, and you need to be praying. And this nun, brrrr, Margaret said, thank you. She said, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm jotting down everything you're saying, and I will tell Sister Helen they recorded it. And I came home, and we had this raft of stuff. And the emails, and the emails, and it was everywhere. Facebook page, Facebook page is just loaded with stuff of people. And then you, you move on. You know people are venting. What they're really venting is their anger at what happened to innocent people. And so that you're the, you know you're the lightning rod, and you got to just let the lightning pass through the rod, and then you got to move on. You got to do what you got to do. Sister Helen called me up. I was regional director of Amnesty International in LA and all the 13 Western states in Hawaii. And she said, how about us doing a book tour? I said, a book tour, Helen? She says, yeah, I, I convinced Random House to rent a van and we're going to load it up with uh, books. And uh, I said, okay, uh, I'll talk to Amnesty and, and we'll load up uh, books in this van and we'll do a speaking tour. And uh, so through our contacts, we started up speaking, setting up speaking tours from San Diego to Seattle, which is quite a distance. And, um, and so people started questioning me, well, you're going to be in a van with 12 days and nights with a nun? I said, well, you got to ask the nun. She's going to be with a crazy Mexican for 12 days. And, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't have an expense account that we could go out and eat and and have good food. We slept on people's uh, couches. When we did the walk from Nuance to Baton Rouge, I mean, uh, like like someone said, you know, like walking in the rural South is real different. That's why I tell people oftentimes, as a black person, I don't go camping. You understand? Know that? Historically, they, me camping out in the South somewhere ain't been, I don't care how much they cleaned up these parks. I just don't do it. Don't make sense to me. And it's like walking in the South probably didn't make sense. I'm, to my family, going like, you walking to Baton Rouge, it's going to be a night. I'm like, yeah, but I'm with the nun. We didn't, it's not like we had really planned all this out. We just knew that it was something we needed to do, and everybody kind of agreed with it. A good friend of mine, um, uh, who was, uh, 
God, Indesha Jukali is a good friend, Vietnam veteran, good, good brother. And he had on all his backpack and all his, and, you know, fought in a war and everything. And he said his feet had blistered out <laughs> two miles, his feet. I mean, it was horrendous. So we had a tight schedule, and so sometimes we wouldn't leave a city till late at night, and we'd have to drive most of the night to get in there. So at that point, I really didn't, you know, I was tolerating Sister Helen in general. I didn't like nuns. And so we had a long, hard conversation about nuns, about religion, about white people. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it was a grueling 12 days and nights and not large audiences. So we get to Seattle, uh, uh, Elliott Bay Bookstore. Last question of the night, you know, Sister Helen, Sister Helen. She goes, uh, the title of your first book was Dead Man Walking. What'll be the title of your second book? And she points to me and she said, you know, Lenny, that's what she calls me, Lenny. She said, you see Lenny, that Mexican fellow there? He's very rude to nuns. He's not respectful. He's disruptive. He's, he's an awful man late at night and, and, and just obnoxious. And she says, so I think because of Lenny, the title of my second book will be Why Did the Nun Kill the Mexican? I go, please, please, Helen, why did you have to do that? Why, did, you know, the title of your second book, uh, Why Did the Nun Kill the Mexican? You know, everybody laughed that night. You know, it wasn't like we were walking in friendly territory, you know, because one of the things that I was talking to Helen, and they had churches that kind of opened up to us, you know, that would feed us and stuff like that. And we had these... I don't know, I guess it reminded me, I wasn't, I wasn't active in the civil rights movement. You know, I was born kind of on the cusp or whatever, uh, in the anti-war movement, yeah. But it's like, I, I, it reminded me of what that must have been like. We laughed and told jokes at night. You know, you keep each other up, man, because that's scary, because we got real crazy people, okay? So it's like, when we got to the state capitol, they had people there, right? It was like, whoa, yeah, you know, we got people here waiting on us. Man, we got there, it was the victim's families. I was like, damn, you know, that's hard. Because, you you know, you empathize with, uh, and most of us, I know African Americans who were on that walk had lost family to violence, you know. Um, my little nephew had been shot down in the St. Bernard Project. I mean, we all basically had experienced that. But we also, those of us that were there knew that was also part of our responsibility to make sure that we did not support the state and its violence, just like we don't support folk on the street and theirs. The, the center can't hold on the death penalty at every level. When, when, it's, when it's compared to other situations, when it's laid bare, when you look at it in the context of one murder, one execution, one state, uh, one victim, it never comes out looking good. You know, it, it's, it, it only comes out coarse, ugly, and vulgar. You know, uh, there's a terrible phrase that we say in the legal community, it's a shit necklace. All right. We just went there, did what we had to do, and we left. But the main thing was to make a statement to say that there are those of us in this state who oppose this barbaric thing that you call the death penalty, that it's, it's not right. And it can never be right because your criminal justice system is not right. And so you're not right. Your district attorney offices are not right. Your police departments are not right. Your judges are not right. So it is not right from beginning to the end of it. It is all wrong. And it's layer after layer after layer of being wrong. And so I can't support this up here when I know all of the steps to get there are so foul. I don't think I'll really sleep till this is over. Say your rosary with me. <laughs> Honey, ordinarily I'd love to, but do you know what time it is? I'm pulling rank here. Lights out. We had a sense that something special was happening, but you never know until the audience is there. And I was overwhelmed by the engagement from the audience, the connection, and the silence at the end 
of the audience during the execution when the death machine is in process and suddenly you hear people sniffling and you see people that maybe have never been to an opera before, people who have been to an going to operas all their lives, suddenly shaken and awakened to something very profound going on in the moment, something that we couldn't have known as we were writing it, something that we could only have hoped for. These really big universal themes like redemption, forgiveness, mercy, music can add something that words can't. And I said, I think we have a chance to reach people's hearts with this piece, which will maybe then make their minds think a little differently about a subject they feel their mind is made up about. And I always thought this was a great idea for an opera, and I, well, it's proven, I, Jake wrote a wonderful score, and it's the most performed contemporary opera, and I think it's because it reaches people on so many levels. And personally, as an artist, I felt very humble to do it, because I believe in social change, and I wonder how much I accomplish as an artist. I'm an artist. Sister Helen Prejean is a real person, and I sometimes think real people do more than we artists. They're very, very much pay the compliment back and say, no, art reaches people and forces people to think maybe a little differently. Got this at Goodwill. Talked to Bishop Norwich. He said he would say the funeral mass. Also found a funeral home willing to donate their services. The leaders of congregation met, and we can use one of our own burial plots. If Matt dies, guess who he'll be buried next to? The funny thing was that he's buried next to Sister Isabel. And Sister Isabel, whenever the girls at the academy would get married, and they'd come on their wedding day, come to the convent, there's, here's my little groom, and all the sisters, of, you know, oohing and on over the bride and groom, and you'd hear Izzy in the background saying, I ain't, I'm glad I don't have to share my bed with no man and she has a man buried next to her for all eternity. So we got that in the film. Tim Robbins said, you know, we do need something kind of light. I went, here it is, I got it. And that's, that's the scene. And that's in the cemetery today where this is on. There's Patrick Sonier right next to Sister Isabel. After Richard Glossop's second stay of execution in October of 2015, death penalty abolitionists gathered at Bud Welch's house in Oklahoma City. Today, Richard Glossop still awaits his fate as the Oklahoma administration struggles to fix its execution protocol. One of the things I find so fascinating about who supports the death penalty and who opposes it is it doesn't necessarily fall along predictable lines. You have a lot of people from the faith community, Catholics in particular, who really oppose this, and then you have other good, decent church folk who think it is absolutely a necessary punishment. They cite the eye for an eye passage, which according to Sister Helen is some biblical quarterbacking and is not the true interpretation. While the future role of sisters is unclear, what is evident is their commitment to creating positive change. It's about stripping away everything that keeps us away from really understanding what it is we should be doing right now with the people we have, the experiences we have. You know, there's this thing now that probably the bulk of our members are in what's called adulthood too. <laughs> 
And so the specific gift um, of adulthood, too, is to be free enough to take responsibility for the world, for children, for the planet, and to offer our wisdom to that. So I think that's, that's a pretty good way to go out. If we're going to go out, that's not a bad way to go, you know, to saying we gave it all so that the planet and the next generation could live. I am a sister, and I wouldn't have the spiritual grounding I have today. I wouldn't have the ideas even to get out to do justice without them. I truly am part and parcel of the sisterhood, and it's who I am, and, uh, and I love that, and I love it. I'll say, when I'm writing to the different sisters and someone, I'll go, viva la sisterhood! Viva our sisterhood, because it's what makes us who we are. <laughs>